Okay, so this is uh, the, the title of the talk, Communing with the Dead Online. And I want to note first that um, this, a lot of this work, well, this work, along with some other work I've done recently, has been in collaboration with uh, Lucy Osler. She's a philosopher at the University of Copenhagen, the Center for Subjectivity Research, a postdoc. Uh, she's a specialist in phenomenology, online, sociality, related stuff like that. And so she sort of drugged me into the online world in terms of my recent research, and I've, I've kind of enjoyed it. So this is a paper that we are working on together, a very overdue paper for the grief issue that uh, Matthew and I think Becky, or is it Emily, I forget, or maybe all of you are editing. Um, oh, oh, three of you, this side of the table, please, <laughs> sorry, that's right. So it's, it's nearly there, I promise. Okay, so let me start with a, start with a quote from David Sisto uh, to kind of set the scene for what I want to talk about today. And so he says that if death is a part of life and life has become digital, it is inevitable that death has also become digital, combining the private with the public, the individual with the collective, and the real with the virtual. So we're moving, just as we're moving more and more of our, the practices of everyday life online, so are we shifting more and more of practices related to grieving and death online. And so with that in, in mind, today's questions that I want to consider are pretty straightforward. What role do emerging technologies like chatbots play in our grieving practices? What place do they, what kind of resources can they contribute to these practices? And then I want to consider the question, should we be worried about them? Are there some aspects of these technologies that should give us pause, or at least uh, some issues that might come along that are worthy of further investigation? So three parts to the talk. Um, a bit of background, set the scene, chat box in grief work. I want to then address some worries, a couple of worries that have already been developed in the literature, despite the fact that this, this is a pretty new topic, and then end with one slide of very superficial final thoughts. Okay, so let's start with a bit of background. So I think the first uh, way to, as a point of entry into this conversation, into this topic, is to uh, note that grief is and always has been something that's supported by different technologies. So uh, from uh, mausoleums, from... Uh, from cemeteries to more elaborate practices like death masks. Uh, can anybody recognize whose death mask this is, by the way? Can anyone see? No, interesting. I, it's James Joyce. I don't know, for some reason I saw that immediately. I thought he has such a distinctive face that I saw that right away. Oh, okay. Well, that's James Joyce. And this is a bit of a grim picture, I realized, but I've never actually seen how they make death masks. And so I did some Googling, and that's a picture of a death mask being made. Uh, and then, of course, um, some of the what I find to be rather unsettling, but also strangely kind of haunting and beautiful death photography practices uh, from the Victorian era. This uh, the, this uh, couple's daughter has recently died. She is she's dead in this photograph. But this is part of this common practice of staging photographs with the dead and in poses that suggest they're still alive. Um, and again, so we've always found ways, creative ways, to incorporate technologies into our grief practices, and certainly home movies are an example of this. So here's just a, a short clip from a home movie. I have kind of a fascination with home movies. I don't really have any deep philosophical insight into home movies, I just like them. And YouTube is a great resource just for hundreds of hours of random home movies. And I was watching this, and this is the bit that I love the most. Watch this, this couple, when, they know that when they, the guy on the left sees they're on camera, he nudges the woman on the right. And most of us now are so primed to have our selfie face ready that we would just perform a smile, some sort of action. She's very bashful and, and shy. She looks away from the camera in a way that I find really interesting. I think this was a different time in which people were not prepared with their kind of public selfie face the way that we perpetually are now. But home videos have been a, a, a really a, a important resource that people, whoops, need to watch that again, access the kind of technology they can use to work through their grief. And then just one final example. There's a really powerful uh, scene from the TV series Breaking Bad. Some of you may have uh, watched this series. It's often thought to be one of the best television series of all time, certainly in the top five. And in this series, uh, Jesse, one of the main characters, uh, has recently lost his partner, uh, Jane, to a drug overdose. And he has this practice of calling her every night before bed on his phone, calling her phone, knowing she's not going to answer, but hearing her voice message. And just hearing that and using that as a kind of self-soothing technique. And then one night he calls and it's disconnected. She's not alive to pay her bill anymore, and after a month, her account has expired, and she's no longer there on the other line. And so this, is the, this episode explores some of the emotional complexities of this practice. 
and what that means when Jesse loses access to this well, effective scaffolding, as Ellie was talking about during her viva this morning. And the point here is that our, as our technologies evolve, so do our grieving practices. And much of our grieving practices have now shifted online. Uh, Matthew and I were talking over lunch about the fact that I, uh, during the second lockdown, attended an online funeral for the mother of a colleague, and just how, what an interesting experience that was, people coming together from different corners of the globe to share online space and honor uh, his mother's, and surprising his mother, and surprisingly how well that experience actually worked, how intimate it actually felt, despite some hesitations I had at the outset. But modern technologies now allow for the preservation of our digital remains in online spaces, where there's a sense in which we are perpetually haunted by the dead online. Because when we lose someone, we have access to any number of resources that we can go online and, and use to both remember, but also to grieve them, to kind of share emotions and work through our emotions in real time with the digital artifacts they've left behind. We can look over old chat threads or email exchanges we've had with them. We can scroll through social media posts, photos, videos, blogs, podcasts, etc. And the, the point here is that there now exists more accessible and a greater quantity and variety of artifacts for grief work, including digital artifacts, than ever before. I'm enjoying this little soundtrack. You did you tell me about the music uh, department next door, the occasional kind of tell me if you want me to shut dissonant. No, no, it's all right. It's, I'm enjoying kind of the dissonant little squeaks and honks coming out of the uh, someone practicing their, their free jazz I think, technique. Which I'm, I'm down with that, man. All right. So here's a nice quote from uh, Adam Bubin that expresses this idea. He says that with the advent of the internet and social media, it's become much easier to keep memories alive and to stay connected to those long gone. And that's not really a deep insight, but it's an important insight. I think what's more interesting for our purposes today is that there are more and more interactive ways of encountering and engaging with the dead that are continually being designed. So it's not just a social uh, media post. It's sort of relatively static and frozen in time that we can go back and revisit. There are emerging technologies, like chatbots, as we'll see in a minute, that offer much richer interactive possibilities for grieving with and uh, alongside the dead. So some famous examples to kind of indicate this technology is very much already on the way. It's not, it's emerging, but it's, it's, it's here, and it's only becoming more sophisticated. So some of you may have heard this, that um, Kim Kardashian's, uh, that Kanye West gave Kim Kardashian, uh, this was for her birthday, I think a couple of years ago, a hologram of her father, Robert Kardashian. He had died about 12 or 15 years prior, and this hologram uh, was able to pass on birthday greetings to Kim. Uh, they had a conversation, shared memories. It was responsive to a certain extent to questions that she asked. Uh, and this was a gift that uh, he gave her. Not, not surprisingly, while a lot of people thought that was so romantic, uh, some others thought that was uh, what an expression of immense privilege, many people were creeped out by this. They found it really kind of icky. And we'll come back to this ick factor uh, a bit later. And some of you may have encountered chatbots through the uh, famous uh, Black uh, Mirror episode. Uh, be right back. So in this episode, Martha, this is from I think 2013, the first, I think it was the first season, uh, Martha loses her partner, Ash, uh, from a car, in a car accident. Um, uh, to make a long story short, uh, one, time, one, time, uh, one day someone from a uh, technology company shows up and basically says that we can recreate Ash, or at least a digital, digital replica of him, if you want to give us some his information, just some archives, data, emails, text exchanges, notebooks, photographs, and they first create a chat app that she can talk to, and then she becomes more comfortable with that, it eventually progresses to a robotic replica of Ash, who moves into her home. And uh, the story, uh, the, the episode explores some of the complexities of this new life with uh, the new Ash. And then just a final bit of setup here. This is a, a recent, this is a picture from my Twitter feed. I'm not a big Twitter user. I think you get a glimpse into what's on my Twitter feed, mainly technology and hot political takes. But embedded in uh, my Twitter feed was an ad for Replica AI. It's the number one chatbot companion powered by artificial intelligence. And this is urging me to join millions of people to talk to their own AI friends. And this Replica AI is coming out of technology that uh, was developed back in 2015. So in 2015, um, the, a Russian entrepreneur, Ro Roman Mazarenko, was killed in a car accident in Moscow. And his friend, a software and app designer, Eugenia Kudya, I think is how you pronounce her last name, built a chatbot called Replica, 
based on a treasure trove, an archive of Roman's online communication. And again, just social media posts, emails, texts that she fed into this uh, neural network that then created a bot that would reply to instant messages in Roman's voice. A similar thing happened in 2016. James Lajos built a chat bot called DadBot, which I love. DadBot was programmed with, uh, based on transcribed interviews that uh, James made with his father, John, uh, before John died of cancer. And then just a couple of years ago, Microsoft were granted a patent for a method of recreating, of creating conversational chatbots modeled to sound like a specific person, such as a, a friend, a relative, an acquaintance, a celebrity, a fictional character, historical figure, etc. So the point here is that this technology is not going anywhere. It's becoming more, uh, more common, more sophisticated, and new ways of communing with the dead online and grieving with the dead online and, and using their digital remains as part of this process are only going to continue to proliferate. So we ought to pay some attention to it and start thinking about it philosophically. So let me now turn to a little bit of background. And normally, uh, in the few times that I've given a version of this talk, I have to spend some time familiarizing uh, people with phenomenological approaches to grief. I don't have to do that because this is where it's all happening. But just um, to kind of set the scene a little bit, when I talk about grief in this context, I'm talking about an emotional response. Grief is an emotional response in the loss of someone who matters to us, a selective emotional response in the loss of, to the loss of someone who matters to us. But it's often much more than this. It's a more complex, much more multidimensional and in interesting ways, richly textured experience as many of you in this room have explored in, in your work. And this, a lot of this work, including work from people in this room, has explored various experiential dimensions of grief, including, interestingly, various sort of disturbed self-world relations that often seem to shape the character and the structure of our grief experience. So Thomas Fuchs has talked about how we, uh, in grief, often experience the presence of the dead as both present and absence, that we experience, we see reminders and cues, markers of the individual within the material artifacts and the spaces we inhabit, reminders that they both once were here with us, but are no longer here. And so this ambiguous phenomenology of grief is the experience of both the dead as present and absent. Um, you all have discussed, not you all, but several people here have, have explored at great length how grief can disturb, disturb not just emotions, but our regulative interpersonal connections with other people, and how grief can unsettle and kind of decenter these relations that we rely upon that involve other people to regulate our emotions. Grief can disturb our experience of time and temporality. We'll come back to that a little bit later using Denise Riley's wonderful work, uh, Time Loop Without Its Flow. And grief can involve disturbances of intercorporeality, this kind of deep kind of shared bodily connection that we feel with others and the sense of self that often arises uh, out of this bodily connection. And then, of course, uh, an important part of the grief experience is this, this feeling that we no longer inhabit a shared habitual world that once involved another person, this kind of world of shared habits and projects and possibilities that give structure and order to our experience of the world and that was dependent upon the presence of the other person. Our, this, our, our, loss, our access to this world goes missing when, when the person who once was a key partner and part of this world is no longer there with us. And I think this notion of grief habits and shared world is really important for what I'm going to say in a little while about chatbots. And so just to say a bit more about that, um, Thomas Fuchs has, has characterized this disturbance of the habitual world in grief as uh, the idea that when we move through spaces that we used to share with the dead, we often have an experience of uncanniness. That the, the world takes on this sort of uncanny character or felt texture. Again, the things and spaces that we encounter are tangible markers of absence and loss. These are things that used to involve other people whether it's you know, the furniture we used to share in our living room, whether it's the tools we would use, the utensils, pots and pans to cook dinner together at night, whether it's just the shape of the bed, uh, the decorations that we collectively chose to, to decorate our house, all of these things, again, are visible markers of absence and loss. And again, not just a physical absence of the dead as a being who no longer inhabits that environment, but their absence uh, in, in a shared world, the absence of a world that used to involve them uh, working in concert with us and creating this shared world. And again, just to kind of drive this point home, the sense of uncanniness arises from a breakdown, according to Fuchs, of, of the habitual world, distinctive of a life once shared with the bereaved, as well as a sense of temporality that helps to organize and maintain uh, 
our sense of rootedness in a shared world and the possibilities it presents. And there's another point about grief before then starting to move more specifically to uh, chatbots. I really like this, um, uh, this point that uh, Matthew and Elliot made about the irony of grief. So here's the quote. They say that in the case of grief, one is not only faced with disorientation, but more specifically, disorientation associated with the loss of someone who would otherwise have provided much needed structure and direction during unsettling times. And so it's not just that we've lost this, this other person we love and care for, and that, that loss is the source of our grief. It's also, this is the irony, that the person who would normally help us negotiate this difficult experience is precisely the person we've lost. We no longer have access to the regulatory resources they provide. Yeah, so I've just said that. And I think one of the many important contributions that this work has made is not just kind of unpacking and exploring some of the phenomenological dimensions of grief that maybe haven't received attention in uh, previous literature, but also emphasizing that grief is not a passive experience. It's not just something that happens to us. It's something we do. We actively maintain and shape grief. We play an active role in shaping the character, the content, and the duration of our grief. And again, we do so by incorporating all sorts of things including technologies, rituals, practices, resources, and relationships to work through and with our grief. Oops. And at least as I want to think about this then, to grieve is to actively explore ways of coming to terms with our emotional response to the loss of someone who matters to us. And importantly, part of the process of grief is to find ways to situate this loss in the broader context of our remaining relationships and commitments, to reintegrate with the world of the living, to put it very simply. That's part of the process of grief. And as we're going to see in a little bit, chatbots might play a useful role here. And this just reminds us that the, our, our grief evolves over time. It's not the same at the end as it is at the beginning. The profile of our grief changes as we establish new ways of being in the world without the other. It's part of the process, once again, of grief. And this is where chatbots, I'm going to suggest, might play a, a role here. All right, so just a final point about the uh, background before then turning to ch chatbots specifically. So as most of you now uh, in this room know, there's been kind of a shift in terms of how clinicians have, have thought about how dealing with grief. There's growing consensus now in clinical psychology that the old way of dealing with grief, kind of emerging the bere uh, urging the bereaved to simply let go and move on, is somehow inadequate. It's not best practice when it comes to managing grief. Of course, this can vary by person, by time, by place, by all sorts of other factors. Um, and the, the idea isn't that we should continue to stay in the same place, so to speak, when we grieve. That can become pathological. But nevertheless, it's recognized that cultivating enduring relationships with the deceased, instead of just rushing to move beyond them or move to let them go, let them recede into the past, can be a healthy part of the grieving process. It can have a highly therapeutic value in terms of emotionally coping with loss. And for our purposes today, an important part is these technologies that we always have and continue to use in our grief work can be an important part of this process. They can be an important part of the repertoire of grieving rituals that we use to maintain continuing bonds with the dead. Continuing bonds that help us uh, uh, maintain a sense of tangible connection with the dead that furnish not just new ways of relating to the dead, but as we're going to see, new possibilities for reintegrating with and carrying on within the world of the living. That's going to be an important point. OK, that's more than enough, I think, background. Again, you all know this stuff. This is where all this interesting work is happening. Uh, so let me now talk about chatbots and say a bit about the role that chatbots potentially might play in grief work. So what role do chatbots play in all of this? What kind of resources might they offer? Again, just to remind you why I think this is an important question. This is technology, as we've seen, exists, and it's only become more widespread. It's quickly emerging as, a, as an important and central transitional object of grief, as Goldstein and colleagues put that. I like that expression, this notion of a transitional object of grief. And I think one of the points that Lucy and I, Lucy and I want to make with this paper is that chatbots might be, might prove to be, despite the initial ick factor I think we all feel that I'll talk about, useful transitional objects of grief. Uh, objects and technologies that don't help us or cause us to stay rooted in our grief, uh, 
uh, rooted in the imminence of our grief, but help us kind of transition into different phases of our grief and our reintegration with the living. And again, I think this is, that just means we should take the time to think more carefully about these technologies and uh, how they might at least be open to some of the ways that they might work and the contributions they might make to the grief work that we all will face at some point in our lives. Okay, so just to start with now a, a kind of a, a way of kind of narrowing in a bit on chatbots. So I think the first observation uh, to make is that chatbots seem to offer richer, flexible, and more dynamic interactive possibilities than many more traditional objects of grief. These interactive possibilities, as we're going to see in a minute, can help us dynamically maintain and recalibrate aspects of the habitual worlds that we share with those who have died and, and kind of address the, the kind of the loss, the sense of abness, absence of these habitual worlds that we feel and that's so central to the experience of grief. So just to give you a couple of examples here. So again, what role might chatbots play here? What kind of interactive possibilities might they furnish? One we might characterize as conversational habits. So we can imagine uh, as a way of kind of rebuilding some of these habitual worlds uh, with a therapeutic kind of aim in mind, using chatbots to engage in the kind of practices that we used to engage in when the person was still with us. So texting with them after work, for example, a quick update. You know, how was your day? Oh, I had a long day. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I'm really looking forward to watching a movie tonight and having a beer going uh, to a favorite park for a walk and talking about it, just kind of self-narrating one's own experience to this chatbot, externalizing one's experience that way. And these are important because, again, remember, you're getting, we're getting feedback from the chatbot. We're not, it's not just a one-way thing. These chatbots are calibrated to give responses, cues and responses that speak the voice of the person that we've lost. And what's important to observe here is these narrative habits are ways of kind of reestablishing our habitual world. These narrative habits are one of the ways that we provide structure and order to our days. These narrative habits or conversational habits help us to make sense of and interpret our thoughts, our actions, and our experiences. And so in kind of extending this process to include a chatbot, there's a sense in which this process again becomes a shared process. This is a habitual world that's coming up, springing up around a shared practice involving us and the chatbot. And within this, of course, are various complicated emotional and affective processes. And so I think one of the really interesting things that you all have been doing here, one of the many things that I think has been really important in this project on grief, is to look at the relationship between what we're going to call, what Lucy and I call habits of intimacy and emotion regulation and emotional sharing. And so the deep way that we are dependent upon others for regulating our emotions in everyday life, including our experience of grief. So here's a nice quote. Uh, from Eugene Genlin to capture this idea. Uh, and this is something I think most of you are probably familiar with. But he says, we all know people with whom it is best not to share anything that matters to us. If we have experienced something exciting, and if we tell it to those people, it will seem almost dull. So there's a sense in which the other's response or lack of a response will downregulate our own enthusiasm cynical, if they're a bit negative, if they're kind of just a sour person, they're never excited about anything. Sharing that experience will drain our own experience of the vitality and color that it, that it should otherwise have. But if you were lucky, Genlin continues, that's a loud doorbell. If you are lucky, you know one person with whom it is the other way around. This is the other side of the coin. If you tell that person something, they will upregulate the experience, intensify and, and bring complexity and felt richness to the experience. This is because if you tell that person something exciting, it becomes more exciting. A great story will expand. You will find yourself telling it in more detail, finding the richness of all the elements more than when you only thought about it alone. And again, the point here is that in sharing our emotions and our and kind of making ourselves intimate and vulnerable by sharing emotions and experiences with another person, they can of course downregulate and diminish the experience. But very often, sh that sharing and the it, the has it has the opposite effect. Again, it deepens and enriches the experience. And I think this is where again, chatbots potentially can have this kind of interpersonal emotion regulative function in sharing our experiences, engaging in some of the conversational habits 
the narrative practices that I was talking about previously. Uh, chatbots can help shape our emotions, and as well as the experience of the surroundings and the shared possibilities they present. So as we're going through our environment, engaging in these narrative practices, these narrative practices of sharing, what, again, our, whether it was our day at work, uh, the park we're in, the experiences we're having, walking through a museum, whatever, there's always going to be an emotional effective component. We're not just sharing an emotion, we're not just sharing information, we're sharing emotions. And so chatbots can help play uh, that sort of regulative role potentially uh, for the individual. And then the final example, uh, something, uh, and again, there's a lot more we can say about all of these things in detail, but I'm, to be honest, I'm more concerned getting on to consider some of the, uh, the worries uh, that one might have about chatbots. So I just want to kind of sketch, just a very, in a very general way, some of, some of the ways that chatbots might provide important resources for reestablishing this, these habitual worlds. And then in the paper, we get into some of these in more detail. The third uh, is what we're calling habits of shared time, or shared temporality, which Schutz calls growing old together, finding ways to inhabit temporality in a way that fosters not just the narrative practices and the shared emotions that we talked about earlier, but this deep sense of intimacy and moving through time together. Uh, again, what Schutz describes as growing old together. And I think we can get a sense of how this might go and why this is such an important part of uh, the grieving process by looking at Denise Riley's work, the poet Denise Riley. So I think Matthew, I think you were the one that first turned me on to this book years ago, maybe even way back in Durham. I think you had first mentioned it, if I recall. Uh, I think most of you know this book, but for those who don't, uh, it's a wonderful book called Time Lived Without Its Flow. And uh, Riley wrote this book uh, upon losing her, uh, her adult son from a sudden death, an undiagnosed heart condition, if I remember correctly. I think he actually died on holiday. That, I think that that's, that's the story. And uh, at this point, Riley was an acclaimed poet. She hadn't written much work for some time. Uh, but as part of her own grief work, she wrote this book that basically chronicles her story, her attempt to come to terms with the loss of her adult son, unexpected loss. And it's, it's a beautiful book of poetry, but I think it's also a powerful book of phenomenology describing from the inside the different structures and temporal dynamics of how she comes to inhabit a world uh, that no longer contains her son. So here's how she describes the disturbance of temporality, this kind of freezing or stopping of time that she experiences when her son dies. She says that his sudden death has dropped like a guillotine blade to slice right through my old expectations that my days would stream onwards into my coming life. So time suddenly loses its flow, its forward-looking flow. It literally stops the moment that her son dies. No plans can be entertained, although you keep up an outward show of doing so. And so an important part of her account here is it isn't just that her own experience of time as an individual is distorted. She loses a grip or a sense that she's inhabiting shared time, that she's in a world comprised of shared projects and commitments that involve other people, and that tacitly connect her to other people within time, within shared time, as it moves forward. Oops. And I think she's, uh, Riley is very insistent that the complexity, the phenomenological complexity of this experience is not captured by the familiar and threadbare remark that time stopped. Again, the, the kind of freezing of time she's describing is more structurally complex than just this, this standard way of saying, and then time stopped. There's more, more going on here than this. And if you look carefully at how she describes this experience, it becomes clear that Riley knows that time has not actually stopped. She knows that the decisions and actions today will shape her tomorrows, even as she feels a deep dissociation or kind of alienation from the future and a closing down of future possibilities and shared projects. Again, live time has stopped. This kind of forward-looking momentum of, of time has stopped the moment of her son's <coughs> death. But there's also an interesting, I think, kind of solace she finds in this stopped time. In inhabiting this stopped time with her son, offers a kind of solace, a form of care, as she puts it, that will not give up its affectionate task. Living in this stopped time, despite the suffering it brings her, despite the pain that it brings, is a kind of way, a way of maintaining a continuing bond with her son, even as the rest of the world moves on without him. She describes this experience this way, and this, I think, really hints at the complexity of the experience. Again, that it's, it's an awful, distressing thing but it also brings a kind of perverse comfort. She says that inhabiting stop time is a kind of living inside two lives. You're fused with the dead, 
as if to animate them. And so it's a way then of inhabiting the time of the dead within a pocket within the present, as it were. And again, that's an affectionate task, a way of maintaining a, a form of continuing bonds with her son, finding ways to inhabit that stop time while finding ways to reintegrate into the, the forward-moving time of the present, of the living. And I think this is where uh, chatbots, again, provide resources for doing this, in engaging in some of the practices that I was talking about, the narrative practices, habits of shared intimacy, shared emotions, using chatbots as in terms of their emotion regulative possibilities. I think chatbots furnish resources for creating and inhabiting a pocket of the timeless past that, importantly, to uh, mirror Riley's uh, descriptions, remains embedded in the flow of the present. They create a kind of interactive space. It isn't just about remembering the dead, the funny things they used to say or the way they used to say these things, but rather allowing us to kind of recalibrate our relationship with the dead in real time as we kind of haltingly move forward into the forward, the future of the living. And I guess the point is to kind of sum this up before turning to some worries. Chatbots might provide useful resources to help navigate in real time the emotional complexities and the loss of meaning that arises from the felt absence of the person who's died, as well as potentially our habitual relationship to the world that now exists without them. Uh, and as I've just kind of sketched in very general terms, I want us to at least be open to the possibility that despite the initial ick factor, which I'm now going to talk about in a second, maybe they offer some resources for maintaining continuing bonds that help us to explore and construct new ways of relating to the absence of the dead. All right, um, just to turn to some worries uh, before then, just very brief final thoughts and I'm done. So I've mentioned a couple of times the ick factor. I think most of you, if you're like me, start thinking about the possibility of chatbots and you, you have this immediate kind of visceral, hmm, that just seems uh, a little creepy, a little grim. Uh, for what it's worth, I, Matthew knows this, we were chatting, uh, and actually Luis and I were talking about this this morning as well. So my, my dad died in January, and so I've been kind of working on this paper with Lucy on grief while engaging in grief work, thinking about my dad's death. And when Lucy and I were first talking about this topic, uh, I had a strong ick response to the very possibility of chatbots. And I've, I've, even, I've been thinking about uh, whether or not I would want a chatbot of my father as part of my grieving practice right now. And I'm still undecided for what it's worth. Some days, yes. More days than not, no. But the point is, I'm, I'm sympathetic to this ick response. And what's interesting here is that uh, if you look at, well, there was a, this is a, from a, a Twitter post just back in January. Uh, the Independent had a story uh, basically uh, chronicling this patent, this Microsoft patent that I talked about earlier. And you can see this uh, uh, Twitter user surveillance, Killjoy, says tech companies still think Black Mirror is a blueprint, not a cautionary tale. And this, Tim O'Brien is one of the engineers actually on the project. He's involved in um, the ethics board at Microsoft. And he says, I'm looking into this. Uh, the application date, April 2017, predates the AI ethics reviews that we do today. I sit on the panel. And I'm not aware of any plan to build or ship this technology. And yes, it's disturbing. So this is someone actually involved in the project, affirming the ick factor, trying to kind of blunt that response by saying, yes, we understand that this technology is, uh, would elicit this kind of response. But we can get a little more sophisticated, I think a little more rigorous, and maybe starting to articulate, what exactly are we responding to? What, what is the source of this ick response that we all feel? And does it pose a genuine worry or issue when it comes to thinking about even the possibility of integrating chatbots into our grieving practices? So the concern, and this has been nicely articulated by Patrick Stokes and Adam Bubin in some recent work, is that when we use chatbots, even in a benign way, we move from recollecting the dead to trying to replace them in a way that's unhealthy and potentially will inhibit or get in the way of our recovery, our grief work. And I'll develop this in a bit more detail in a second. But here's a quote that uh, Bubin gives us. He says that consider the following difference, uh, sorry, excuse me, consider the difference between the following means of preservation after a loss, such as the loss of a loved one, recollection and replacement. The former aims to keep us aware of what has been taken from us. It is thus, in part, an attempt at preservation of an irremedial void. But the latter, replacement, seeks to overcome, ignore, or at least mitigate the fact that anything has been lost at all. It is an attempt at preservation of the status quo. 
And Stokes gives us kind of building on this two reasons why we ought to resist replacement in the context of chatbots and grief. He said, first is it's a kind of Kantian objection. So using chatbots treats the dead as a kind of resource. It instrumentalizes them when we use their online traces as a way to eliminate or mitigate our own suffering. So we're not treating them as end in themselves, but as, as a means to achieving our own end, namely mitigating our grief or our suffering. And secondly, in doing so, we, we fail to acknowledge or honor the dignity of the living, we or and the dead. We treat the living as replaceable as well. To replace the irreplaceable is to concede, he says, that it was never, it was in fact, it was never in fact irreplaceable at all. It implies you don't love this specific person here, but whoever or whatever turns up to fulfill certain roles they play in your life. So I might, it's not just, I don't just love this Matthew, I love whatever chatbot or any other resource might come along and fill the same functional role that Matthew seems to play in my life, basically insulting me endlessly and damaging my self-esteem. And then occasionally saying very nice things completely throw me off that I can't deal with. I'm kidding. And the point is that not only is this disrespectful to the dead, but also the living. It fails to honor the integrity and the value of the living because we, it causes us to view everyone as replaceable in some functional sense. And additionally, Stokes says that a worry here maybe is more kind of a pragmatic worry, that we might start off with good aims and using chatbots, we might have noble intentions, but what might start out as a practice of remembrance could very easily uh, slide into a practice of replacement that's vulnerable to the same concerns I just said. And what he says is that in using technology to enhance our recollection of the dead, we may end up in effect forgetting that they are dead. And this then I think brings a third concern to the foreground when it comes to replacement. In using chatbots, we aren't really creating continuing bonds with them the way that I tried to suggest that we are in the, the second, the bits that I was sketching in the second section. Instead, they become a means for maintaining a kind of delusion, pretending that the dead don't exist, uh, haven't, excuse me, haven't died at all. So we're not really dealing with our grief. We're maintaining our sense, our, ourselves in a kind of unhealthy delusion that the, the dead are still with us. Okay, so this is the worry. I think these are all very legitimate. I think these are really serious worries that ought to be taken seriously. And I, and I share some of these concerns. But let me, again, just for the sake of argument now, and just kind of opening the possibility of chatbots, push back a little bit uh, in the remaining uh, uh, slides that I have here. So as we've seen, chatbots, uh, using chatbots, isn't always or even primarily about remembering someone. I think it's important to note that the, the sketch I was giving, those three different practices that we might use to incorporate chatbots into our grief work, None of them involved, necessarily involved recollecting or remembering someone. We're not trying to scaffold past memories of that person. Rather, we're looking for something much more interactive, dynamic, and real time. We're looking for the opportunities to engage in conversational interaction, to talk about our days, our plans, uh, as well as talk about how we miss the individual and the kind of habits of intimacy and shared emotion that these interactive possibilities present. It's not remembering, it's something much richer and more interactive. And the idea here is, at least as we've tried to suggest, Lucy and I tried to suggest, is that in these practices, the dead, as Riley reminds us, are brought into the presence. They're reanimated, in a sense, in these conversations. They're addressed as though they can hear what is being said, that what is being said to them means something and matters to them, even though we know they're dead. But again, the, po the point here is, it's, we're doing more than just trying to remember the dead. And we might ask further, in using chatbots, are we, or even would we, really be striving to replace the person who has died? And a, a problem with this, some of these worries that Stokes and uh, Bubin pose is that recollection and replacement are not the only um, ways that we might engage with the dead. This seems to present a kind of false binary. And there are two additional reasons why we might want to resist this replacement narrative. First, so I was using... Um, uh, some uh, auto-generated uh, design art. So uh, PowerPoint, as many of you probably know, when you, when you make slides, will suggest design ideas to you. And it was relentlessly trying to get me to use this image. I kept putting chatbot, chatbot, chatbot in the slides. So it was trying its very best to get me to use this image, and I finally succumbed. Like 30 slides in, I finally gave up, and it's actually kind of cute. But that's why I have this, this image here, um, just to stop PowerPoint from harassing me. Okay, I think there's a practical reason. First off, chatbots, 
only provide what we might call a kind of thin reciprocity, not the thick reciprocity of persons. While we can share with chatbots in the ways that I was talking about, they can't robustly share with us, of course. This sharing is asymmetrical. It's one way, and the shared world that we create is itself, with the chatbot, is itself asymmetrical. Our world contains surprises, joys, interactions, difficulties that exist outside of our interaction, of course, with the chatbot. But that's not the case for them. And importantly, we know this. I'm going to come back to this in a minute. I think this is one of the reasons we come to chatbot, chatbots with certain expectations. This is, why, this is why we go to chatbots. We know that they can only give us a kind of thin reciprocity, that they lack uh, the full world they can, that they can um, without our ability, without our input, in other words. I'm going to come back to that idea in a second, and I think it's important to return to. And then, of course, oops, there, uh, when we talk to chatbots, there's also a loss of spontaneity, the kind of novelty and unexpectedness that we, do, that we have and experience when we interact with persons. In addition, of course, to the various embodied and emotional, affective dimensions, the kind of intercorporeality or interaffectivity as Fuchs described it, these rich sort of embodied dynamics that shape how we interact with one, one another in face-to-face -face context. But the point here is that when we interact with people, we're more than just the conversational goods that we provide others, the information that we provide others. And so I think recognizing this is one of the reasons that we don't go to chatbots with the same kind of expectations that we have when we interact with persons. We recognize that what we get from others is more than just conversation. There's something much thicker and richer going on in an embodied way. But then secondly, I think there's a theoretical reason uh, uh, that we might consider here. And this is Kate Norlock. She says, what kind of relationship do we look to construct with chatbots? What, what are we looking for when we actually go to chatbots, at least potentially? What kind of relationship do we want to have with them? And I think it's one based on a kind of imagination. And so here's how she puts this idea in the context of grief and the dead. She says that perhaps many re uh, readers have had the experience of not just thinking about a dead friend or family member, but holding an inner dialogue or an argument with the departed individual, or imagining their response to one's actions or beliefs, or maintain a practice previously shared with the deceased because it was shared with the deceased. Again, this practice of kind of engaging in these practices that Norlock is talking about, these imaginative practices, it's not attempting to replace the person we're imagining, it's rather a way of kind of scaffolding or externalizing uh, various aspects of this imagined relationship in the service of creating continuing bonds, kind of running through the old habits and routines, the practices that made up this shared world, not because we're trying to replace the person we've lost, but maintain this connection with them in this practice, this continuing bond. So I think this, this replacement worry is a bit too strong, and it really doesn't adequately capture what we look for when we engage in grief work. And then I think a final point, and then I'm going to move to a conclusion and then the end of this talk and see what you think about this. I think additionally, both recollection and replacement might seem like potentially static or rigid ways of thinking about how we might use chatbots in grief, either to um, recollect, remember somebody, or replace them. But grief is not a static relationship, as we've seen. And again, this is one of the really important things that's come out of this project here at York. Grief is a process. And as we go through that process of our grief, our relationship with the person who has died continues to change. And so too might our relationship with the chatbot, especially as we develop new habits, new relationships, build a new shared world, uh, and reintegrate with the living. And so I think it's very easy to think of a case where maybe we're more dependent on chatbot early on in the early stages of our grief, and then gradually phase out our dependence as our grief evolves and changes over time, and we learn how to inhabit, re-inhabit the world uh, without the person we've lost. And looking at the narratives of the people that use chatbots in the few cases that already exist supports this idea. It's, I think, first-person phenomenological evidence, at least some narrative evidence. So here is, uh, this is a nice article a couple years ago by Casey Newton, a technology writer, interviewing, uh, um, uh, I've already lost her first name, uh, the person I introduced earlier, uh, Kuja is her last name. She says that uh, it turned out that the primary purpose of the bot uh, in creating the spot, the Roman spot replica, the bot of her friend. It turned out, this is now Casey Newton writer's voice, it turned out that the primary purpose of the bot uh, had not been to talk, but to listen. All those messages that were about love or telling him something they never had time to tell him, Kujak, his friend who created the bot said. So all the, the messages that she, would, she found she was sending to Roman. 
Even if it's not a real person, there was a place where they could say it. They can say it when they feel lonely. So the way that people, and this is not just looking at the messages that she would send, but looking at how their uh, friendship circle used replica, which again was replicating uh, Roman, the, the friend they'd lost. When she compiled messages that friends and family members had sent replica, this is what she found. Lately, she says, she's begun to feel a sense of peace about uh, Mazarenko Roman's death. In part, that's because she built a place where she can direct her grief. In a conversation, <coughs> excuse me, we, this is Casey Newton, uh, had this fall. She likened it to just sending a message to heaven. This is, her, again, in her voice. For me, it's more about sending a message in a bottle than getting one in return. So again, this thin reciprocity, there's a certain kind of expectation that she has about the kind of interaction resources she's going to get from the chatbot. So to sum up, to kind of make this as simple as possible, there are clearly ways that chatbots are limited to thin reciprocity, what we're calling thin reciprocity. That's not a surprising idea. But maybe this is the key idea for blunting the ick factor a bit. Maybe, and to kind of push back against recollection replacement worries, maybe this is all we want. We only want a kind of thin reciprocity from chatbots. And if that's so, this, this makes them as a resource, as a technology for grief work, particularly well-suited for scaffolding a kind of imaginal relationship with the dead of the sort, not trying to, re trying to replace or even recollect, but to kind of construct an imaginal relationship with the dead. And also a resource to encourage continuing bonds, precisely because they are not a perfect replica. That's not what we want, once again. And the fact that they're not a perfect, perfect replica forces us to adjust and change our relationship to the dead as we learn to reintegrate with the world of the living. And maybe the key idea here is then that our motivation to use them may not be about recollection or, um, or replacement, but rather about kind of easing into and not eradicating our loss, acknowledging and using them as a resource for easing into our loss instead of finding strategies to eradicate our loss and pretend that it didn't happen. At least that's what this, the reports that exist seem to suggest. And it's telling that at the end of the Black Mirror episode, which you can't really see because the lighting isn't great, uh, Ash's robot replica ends up in the attic with the rest of the furniture in the house. That's where he spends the rest of his days. Um, final thoughts, my superficial thoughts to conclude this. So I guess the, the, the takeaway points are the following. So whatever well-founded reservations we may have about this technology, and they are well-founded, these concerns are legitimate. It's only going to become more sophisticated and more prevalent, and we ought to take it seriously. And what we were hinting at at the end of what I said, uh, and, and one of the things we're trying to just kind of gently like, push in the paper is that these technologies may have a kind of therapeutic value, a potential, if we, if we cast, that gets lost, if we cast these technologies and the possible roles they might fill in our practices in stark or exaggerated terms, like these replacement worries, I think, seem to do. And it's important to remember, again, as a way of kind of op being open to this, this possibility, that we've always developed technologies for maintaining continuing bonds with the dead. And chatbots are just continuous with this practice, even as they open up new interactive possibilities that go beyond the possibilities of previous technologies. And I think the existing cases that, do, uh, that are there do seem to be used as a kind of grieving practice, not as a full replacement, but as something that is potentially a healthy and useful way of maintaining a continuing bond with the dead. I think that's enough. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.